Okay, good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming to the uh, third New York View Wellness webinar. My name is Pat Bono. I'm the founder, president of New York View Wellness, which is an educational grassroots 501c3 not for profit organization. It is volunteer run. Um, it has a dedicated website and YouTube channel. We also do two surveys a year for non-migratory beekeepers in New York State. We also provide workshops and trainings. And two of those trainings, we had Randy Oliver um, present and provide um, hive instructions. And I'm really glad he is able to do this webinar this evening. So Randy, are you ready? Hi. So buddy, um, I just just got it, um, 150 mite washed uh, today. We're starting a uh, large fill of the extended release oxalic acid um, on a new uh, matrix uh, using cellulose sponge clips from uh, Sweden, and uh, compare them the efficacy of the treatment um, to the other two approved treatments that can be used while honey supers are on. Now those are uh, Mitaway uh, or Formic Pro or Mite Away Formic Pads, and the um, uh, hops beta acid, the um, hop I just, just got the hop gray, and uh, so we're seeing those against each other and seeing what kind of effort uh, we, we get. Um, and we'll try different uh, levels of the um, oxalic glycerin and see uh, what one is the preferred, uh, the, a new application made for us. Interesting what our findings are. This, of course, for this is most of us still are bees that are not to ver and if we have time, then we'll um, give you an update on our selective breeding gram for varroa. Uh, we're just doing this um, uh, mite washing two days ago, and my son called me and said, "Hey, Dad, you know if uh, more than 20% of the yard have mite counts of less than should we still want as potential breeders?" And I'm, yeah, let's okay. So we're um, uh, we're working right now on, uh, and have been for a few years now, uh, breeding for resistant queens. And like I said, if we have, can't have time, I'll do an update on that. But it looks like we're getting traction. We're getting a larger proportion of, of our colonies, which are showing resistance to varroa. And we have some colonies that are absolutely 100% resistant, resistant to varroa, big honey producing colonies that need no mite treatment whatsoever. The, the mites just disappear in those colonies. Until then, <clears throat> we need to uh, work on varroa management. It's the beekeeper's responsibility to uh, do so. And our beekeeping success is largely dependent upon how well you are an, able to manage varroa to help your colony. So I just posted a brand new updated version of my uh, varroa model. And uh, it looks like this. Let me, in fact, let me just go to a new share here. And I'll go to Okay, so now you've got my Varroa model up here, and I'm going to, let's see, uh, show the tabs. Okay, so this is the way the new uh, mite model uh, works. For the treatments, instead of having them vertical where they were before, I realize it's more intuitive to put them directly below uh, the dates. So now what you can do is you fill in these three green cells for your, uh, wherever you're keeping. So like if you're gonna do a, start with a nucleus hive, you type N right in there, and that will change it now. So now your nucleus hive starts the uh, first of April and that's a nuke building up. And you can put in P for package. You can put a Northern elevation or um, Southern elevation in there. We're gonna default right now, which is kind of a, a standard um, model right here where the top line shows your uh, colony population, the, the adult bees in the hive. Uh, this shows the amount of sealed brood in the hive, the orange. The red is the percentage of the seal brood that is infested by a, a mite. Here's your mite population in the hive. And this is your, would be an alcohol wash or a good detergent wash or even a sugar shake if you do it oh, well. So that's, this is mite monitoring, how many mites there are per half cup of bees right here. And then you can enter, let's just say uh, you do a, a treatment in May and you kill 80% uh, of the mites and let it, well, my computer's running very slow for some reason. Uh, you see, you reduce that mite population. You can get by until middle of August, the middle of August. 
you do a, a treatment, kills 90% of the mites. And you're looking pretty good. You went into winter a little bit high. So let's just say uh, late November, you do an oxalic acid dribble and say you kill 80% of the mites uh, right there. And you started with 100 mites in the springtime and you ended with 59 mites in the uh, going into winter. So that's sustainable. You, you start you end with fewer mites than you started with. So by using this model, the, the model is all based upon the reality of what you see as an alcohol wash. So very briefly, let's just say you go out to your hive right now and clear all the dates. So let's just say, so this is mid June right now. And let's just say that your alcohol wash is 15. Well, this shows six. So that means you, so you want to adjust it to your actual alcohol wash for whatever date you do your first wash. So we're going to, let's see, we want to go from six up to 15. So let's triple our starting number of mites right here. We're going to try to get this. And so we go, oh, look at that. So now we're, we're right around 15 right here. So now we're, now we're in reality for wherever you are. So you've just calibrated the model for your reality, for your alcohol wash on this date. And you can fine tune that. Maybe it'd be 280 mites. But anyway, you want to see what your alcohol wash is. Now you say, oh my gosh, this is way too many. I better do a treatment right now. And depending on your treatment, let's say you put, get a 90% kill there. What that's going to do is drop it down and that's going to buy you some time. So not, it's not going to take care of mites for the rest of the year, but until they get up to this level again. So mid-August, you're going to want to do another, another treatment, say another 90% uh, reduction. And now you're looking pretty good. Still not sustainable for the winter. You're going to the winter with 383 mites. So you're going to have to do something else late in the season, typically an oxalic acid a dribble or a vaporization right here. And let's just say you get 85% uh, mite, mite kill right here. And great. Now we're, now we're way down. We've gone from 300 mites uh, early on down to 58. So very sustainable. And you can scroll down here. This will tell you the types of, of uh, colony settings you could use here. And you can customize this to make your own for your own colonies. And this tells you, you roughly your efficacies that you would have for your different kinds of, of treatments. And somebody wrote in was asking about the formic acid. Um, I don't have really good efficacy data on the formic. I will be having some in two months. I'll let you know what I, what I get with the new formic pro out there, see what kind of reduction. And then I, as I find get better data, I recalibrate uh, these settings right here for you to use. Okay, let's go back to, I want to do a new share. Back to this one here. And it's back to here and from the current slide. Okay, so that's our current, uh, my current mite model right now. <clears throat> and what, we're, what we're looking at, there's, there's four stages in a season in a colony. You have your buildup phase after, that starts right after the first tree pollens come in. When the colony has a, just starts to top out the sealed brood, it goes to, into reproductive phase, which is swarming. Or if you don't want them to swarm, it's called making up nukes or splits or shaking bees out of your hive so they don't swarm. Um, then you go into the food storage uh, phase after they recover, all that sealed brood emerges. <clears throat> they put on their honey crop, you typically remove the honey here, and then uh, you go into the dirt survival mode where there's not much honey coming in. Now in New York, you have much less dirt survival than we have out here in California. So, but this is standard anywhere in the world. You build up reproduction, food storage, dirt, and survival for for honey, honey bees. Now, as far as what you can do for your potential treatments that you can use, you're gonna, in most areas, this takes two to three 90% reductions or four 80% reductions in order to get the mites down. Now, if you wanna do something like powdered sugar dusting, which is about a 50% reduction, that might take 10, 10 of those treatments throughout the year. So I'm not saying that any, that the different kinds of treatments don't work, it's not a question of whether they work or not, it's the efficacy. What percent of the total mite population any treatment um, reduces the population by? And that's on my mite model. You can put that in there and you can uh, uh, do whatever you want, uh, but, but go with real numbers, go by real reductions. Now, what I put here is what you can use, what's legal at different types of the season or what works well. For example, when you have honey supers on, you're limited to only a very few uh, uh, treatments. And oxalic right now is not approved for use when honey supers are on, even though it's, there's plenty of data that shows it doesn't get into the honey. No one's bothered in the United States 
to submit that data package to the EPA because the oxalic is the registrant is the um, USDA Agriculture Research Service, and they just haven't yet bothered to submit a data package. So um, I'm trying to encourage them to do so. The more letters they get from other beekeepers to do so, <laughs> maybe the more action will happen. But there's plenty of hard data worldwide that shows that uh, the oxalic treatments don't get into the honey and they should be registered for use while the honey supers are, are on. When the honey supers aren't on, then you could use the apivar, the uh, apigard, or uh, the amitraz, if, if you were wished, or the time wall treatment. Um, what we do in our operation in California, and this is only us that's not saying what you should do, we, our colonies come back from almonds big and strong. We split them down to uh, split them four ways afterwards and uh, do an oxalic acid dribble after an induced brood break. We also take out a drone trap frame and requeen them. And that takes our mite count way down. So we start off with zeros and, and ones here. Um, around the 1st of July, the mite counts have uh, built up. And that's why we've just started testing uh, right now. We had an early spring because of the very warm weather. So we're starting uh, mite washing a little early. And this is when our mite counts start hitting around that six mites in an alcohol wash. And we'll use a formic treatment while the honey supers are on to bias time until middle of August when we've pulled our honey off. And then we, we've been using the time all uh, very effectively, get the mites down. After that, unlike you guys in New York, we don't have a fall pollen flow here. So we feed protein and uh, to uh, rear a generation of, of, of brood to make our winter cluster. And then we give them an oxalic acid dribble when they uh, at minimum brood. And they nowadays they may not go broodless in our climate. Um, and and we are, we've used this system for a number of years and it's very successful. If we get the oxalic acid extended release with glycerin registered, we may be using that instead of these two treatments right here. But right now it's not registered and I'm not promoting anybody using an uh, unregistered uh, treatment. So let's just say you're gonna go out and do mite monitoring. So uh, we'll talk about best sampling methods. And I, I just sat, came back from and moved some things around. Um, I, as far as frame, we'll see how far we get. I just published the best sampling methods in American Bee Journal. I'm gonna give you a preview on the other research that I've been doing uh, now. <clears throat> so a lot of commercial guys who use the ether roll, this has been shown to be very inaccurate. So um, you can do it, but I, I wouldn't put much faith in the ether roll count. That doesn't recover the mites that well from the sample. Many people use the sugar shape uh, method, and that can be accurate if it's properly uh, performed. <clears throat> We're gonna be doing a bunch of testing on this uh, this next week or so uh, to quantify the accuracy of this and to see just uh, uh, look at the technique and, and look at all the details of the technique and see uh, how we can best use this. I also wanna um, get some data. I, I haven't seen any data on what percentage of these bees even if they walk back into the hive, how many of them actually stay alive for more than a day afterwards? So that'd be interesting to, uh, to find out. Um, a lot of people are hesitant to sacrifice um, some bees for a alcohol wash. Um, uh, and I, and I, I feel that, I understand that, I am, <laughs> I am too. But what I find is I'd, uh, I think the colony would much prefer to sacrifice 300 bees in order to save that colony from dying from uh, varroa mites and deep performing virus. You gotta realize, this time of year, there's a thousand bees roughly a day dying in a healthy colony just from natural mortality. That's, uh, there's a very large population turnover of the bees. So sacrificing 300 bees to um, save that colony is a, a small sacrifice. So here's an interesting uh, paper uh, from uh, 2008 where the researcher, uh, without a whole lot of details, compared different uh, uh, release or separation agents for getting the mites away from the, the bees. And he found with a 70% ethanol or alcohol, which is, or, or it works the same as isopropyl, which many people use. This is the standard scientifically to, you, to uh, uh, you know, kind of the gold standard. And that's what I've used for quite a few years. Um, although this last year, <laughs> we shifted from 70 up to a higher proof, and I'll show you data why we did that. Powdered sugar, also fairly high efficacy. Uh, and uh, water, hot water with detergent. I'm not sure why he used hot water. And we're going to talk about detergent. The Germans used to recommend gasoline, but 
working with gasoline around smokers is probably not the wisest I, idea. So I, I, I would not recommend uh, the gasoline and the etherol did not do uh, very well. <clears throat> so as I started investigating the might wash, I realized there's actually four different steps involved. The first step, you got to get the mites to let go of the bees. Mites hang on the bees really tight. I don't know if you've ever tried to brush a mite off a bee. It's not easy to brush a mite off the bee. The bees try that and they have a very hard time to do it. So step number one is to get the mites to release their grip on the bees. Step number two is then you got to get them off the bees' bodies because uh, gravity, if they, if they release their grip and they're sitting on top of the bee, they're not going to fall off the bee and they get tangled up in the hairs of the bee. So now you have to get them loose from the bees' bodies. And then you have to agitate it enough so that the mites can precipitate. This is the precipitation step. The mites have to fall to the bottom of the container. And we all count on gravity for that. And so far, gravity has not let me down. So I think you can, uh, don't have to consider gravity to be a variable. Unless you're on the, on the top of Mount Everest or on the moon, then, then mite washing uh, would be different because you'd have a different precipitation rate. And then finally, the last step is you have to separate the mites from the bees. And typically what we do is the mites are much smaller. So we have a screen at the bottom and they go through a screen, whether you use a, a kitchen sieve or a filter cloth or a, a, in, a built in screen. So there's, there's four steps. And what I've been doing is investigating each of these four steps. So first thing, let's, let's talk about mites, how they hang on to the bee. And on the bottom of the bee, uh, this is where the, the mites usually are. They're usually more often on, on the left side of the bee, but here's one on the right side. And you can kind of see here, it's halfway underneath one of these sclerites uh, here at the, uh, at the bottom of the bee. These are the plates that cover the bee. So the, the, the bee, bees have these uh, two have overlapping plates like this, and the mites squeeze right into this space. And right at the, at the joint of the two plates, there's a soft integument, and that allows the adenine to stretch out when the crop uh, becomes full of nectar or water. And that's where the mite is able to feed by uh, going through that soft in, integument uh, in there. And what I did is to take this picture, I found out a, a different mite monitoring method. You don't have to kill any mites. And I'm going to experiment more with this one for accuracy. You just take a little um, clamshell, uh, a clear uh, poly polyethylene PETE um, uh, food container. And uh, I, I'm publishing the, the, the model number that one I, I've tried. You shake some bees in there, let the older bees fly out, and then close it up. And in 20 seconds, the, the young bees that remain spread out all over the sides of the container. And you can just look at them and look for mites on their bottom. And it's very easy to tell what your, what your, what your mite, or whether the bees have many mites. I, I went to a number of colonies, tried it on them, looking for mites uh, on the bottom of them. And it's very easy to tell if a colony has a high mite infestation. So I'm going to collect some data on this. Um, for us and see how accurate this method is. This may be a whole new method of, of monitoring for mites where no bees have to be killed at all and no fluids or powders or anything else is involved and no shaking is involved. So we'll see, see about this one. So when I did that, then I, I, I picked up, opened up the clamshell and of course you're looking at the bottom of a bee, so now you gotta figure out which bee it is from the top and grab it by the wings. Um, and when I pick them up, then I could then see the mites uh, in uh, under the sclerites. And so I was curious then how hard those mites are embedded. So for example, if you get bit by a tick, the ticks ha really hang onto your skin. I don't know if you ever tried pulling a tick out of your skin or out of a dog's uh, skin or any of the other animal's skin, but it's hard to pull a tick out of, out of, out of skin. And the reason is, is the tick's uh, uh, chelicerate, its mouth parts, are built very much like a bee's stinger. A bee stinger is made of three shafts, um, the, the lancet and two uh, stylets, and the stylets have, have barbed teeth facing backwards like saw blades, and they work independently, and they, and they reciprocate like this in, into your flesh, and they dig that sting right in there, and it's a one way. It's hard to pull the stinger out. Well, the, a tick's mouth parts work exactly the same way, and then some ticks also are able to secrete a glue that bonds to tissue and actually glues the mouth parts in, so I was curious when we're trying to do these, this mite release, the alcohol washes or the sugar shake, how firmly these ticks are, are these mites are attached to the bees. And what I found is I picked up a bunch of bees just like this and took a, um, a needle, a pair of forceps, sharp forceps, to see what would happen. And if you touch a mite, bam, they just 
dig in deeper. They, they, they try to hide. If you brush that mite, you're not going to ever brush it loose. It just grabs it deeper and deeper. But if you pinch the mite with the forceps and pull on it, they pull out relatively easily. So they do not seem to have that type of app apparatus. Uh, 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 hang on a second. Eric, that's a field report coming in from my son. Um, <coughs> so I, I was curious just to how mites hold on to the bees. <clears throat> so I pulled out my microscopes and, and grabbed some mites. Um, this is an easy thing to do. You just drop a mite on its back on a microscope slide. Then you take a clear glass cover slip and we are very lightweight and drop it on top of the mite. And the mite in a second says, hey, let's, I'm upside down, but I'm gonna walk away. And you can watch the mite walk upside down across that glass cover slip. It's really cool to watch. I gotta film a video of this because um, it's neat. At the end of each one of these mites feet on this tarsus here, there's this inflatable balloon called an impodium. And here's a mite about to put its foot down and it's, see the impodium is all closed up. Sorry. Well, you'll, you'll see this impodium right before your eyes in, in two seconds, it inflates like a balloon and it looks like this. And it goes, it, it hits the, the glass and it spreads out and you see it stick on to the, to, the to the glass. And then when it lifts that foot back up, the impodium starts to deflate again. And you can just watch these impodia uh, 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 deflate and inflate as the mite is walking. I found a, uh, a research paper on arachnids and a, a researcher used a uh, special photographic technique and found out that when you put an arachnid into a glass container and allow it to walk on the glass, each one of the impodium leaves a footprint. They're, they have a sticky liquid on them and that's what gives them the grip. This is probably why oxalic vaporization and oxalic dribble work so well is that this stickiness right here is what the oxalic acid dissolves into and then gets into the mite's body. So this is likely the Achilles heel of the mite as far as oxalic acid is, con is concerned. Then I looked at the mites, the front of the mite's body. So here's looking from the underside of a mite. The front legs are up here and, and down here. And these are called the pedipalps. The pedipalps are the sensory organs of the front of the mite, also the mating organ of the, of the male mite. But this is a female mite right here. And you might notice these nasty looking hooks right here on these pedipalps. And I, I talked to uh, uh, Dr. Sammy uh, Ramsey about this, um, what the function of these pedipalps was. And he says it, it appears that it's probably used for anchoring the, the uh, mite in when it is uh, feeding and making the feeding wound. Because in between these here are the chelicerae. You can't see them. I'll show you in a second that actually penetrate. These don't, the, these pedipalps don't penetrate the mite, but these hooks probably grab in there when, when they go, the mite puts its head between the sclerites and help it to pull itself in so it can puncture that integument. Okay, so here's another bottom, it's kind of a side view. Here's the pedipalps. Here's one of those hooks kind of partially in focus. Here's the one of the chelicerae, the pair of This is the actual feeding mouth parts of the mite. This is like a, a knife blade here that cuts through that um, uh, the soft integument. And down here, you can't see it right now, but there's a folded up hooks right here. And if I look at them from the bottom view, so here's the pedipalps, here's the chelicerae, there's, there's two of them, but you have these hooks here. These hooks appear to anchor the chelicerae into the feeding wound so that the, the mite cannot be pulled out. So my question is, with these anchoring apparatuses that the mite has, if we're gonna do an alcohol wash or, or, or mite wash of some sort, you've got to unanchor the mite and get them to release this, this grip. So the first thing you do, if, if I look at anybody doing uh, mite washes or, or sugar shakes, they just shake the hell out of the mice. They just beat them, or the bees, beat them to uh, almost to death in the, in the sugar shake and, and uh, very vigorously. And, and this is what, what I always assumed that you had to do it very, Vigorously, you can see the mites floating around uh, down here. I used to use this for many years. I used this kind of agitator. Midhat Nasser uh, came up with the design of this until I realized the last slosh of alcohol up at the top of here, when it filters down, about 15% of the mites just get filtered out in the bees here. So you under, you tend to undercount your mites using this. So I no longer use anything like this. 
I do a no shaking action. I use a swirl action now, which works much better. But we really don't know. How, how long do you have to agitate? How hard do you have to agitate? How, how much agitation is actually necessary? So what I've been doing this last uh, couple of months is questioning all my assumptions. And this is something that's always good to do, is anything that you're comfortable with is the things that you should be questioning. And any, as soon as I get comfortable with any, any, anything, I start questioning it. So I've collected a lot of hard data questioning my assumptions of what, how best to do an alcohol wash and test each one of them. <clears throat> and the way I can do this is to standardize this, take the, vari the, the variability of the human arm out of it. So it's not up to the, uh, the person doing it. Here's my, um, my uh, uh, ex-assistant, uh, Tara. She's now a uh, grad student. Uh, she's moved on and uh, we still remain very close. Um, like a, a kind of like a daughter to me. She's uh, worked with me for a number of years in, in different projects. And this is the mite washer that we used to use, the agitator. The first one I built and it would hold 12 uh, cups and it has a, a circular action, uh, about three sixteenths of an inch offset and um, uh, very, very effective. We got a, absolutely 100% mite recovery at this, but we'd run the mite samples for about three minutes uh, for each sample and would get very, very uh, good recovery. Uh, tested by saving the wash base and washing them a second time. And we used lots of alcohol uh, to do these. But this was kind of, it had to run off a, a battery, a, a converter, AC converter off the battery and it's kind of unwieldy. So I worked for quite a while coming up with new, new designs, a lot of prototypes. And this is our current uh, agitator we use now. It, uh, it holds the cup right here. It's a, it holds just one cup. It's battery powered, rechargeable. Um, uh, it has a self timer, we just push a button and it gives us 60 seconds of agitation, 300 revolutions, and this has got very good recovery. So I have a number of these agitators used, and this is all we use anymore for, uh, for our mite, mite washing. We can put them on the back of the, of, of the truck and uh, very, do it very rapidly. I've taken my, my Honda CRV and converted it to a dedicated mite washing vehicle. Here's one of my assistants, Sandy, right here. And we have two, two of these agitators right here and the alcohol, everything has a place and it all comes out. And then, and this, this, when you lift the lid, this tray, this tabletop slides out, a leg goes down, it's, you level it and you have a working surface. So in a couple of minutes, you have this whole working surface and between the B yards, we just fold it up, put it away and move to the next yard. So now that I have these standardized agitators, I can do the same, exactly the same agitation on every sample so I can calibrate what actually works or what doesn't work. So first thing I wondered, we had been using 70% alcohol and we found the cheapest place to buy it was at the dollar store. But they also had 50% alcohol, which was even cheaper. And being typical beekeeper trying to pinch pennies, we'd been using the 50% alcohol for some time. But I thought, well, let's challenge that assumption right now. See if the alcohol concentration actually makes a difference. And I went out with a, made up some data sheets and uh, figured that I would do a uh, wash of one after the other until I got complete recovery of the, of the mice, until I got two zeros in a row. And I figured, well, three washes would do it. Well, I found out I had to, out in the field, I had to add wa wash number four, wash number five, wash number six, sometimes up to eight washes before we got complete recovery of the mites. So um, I may expect to do one thing, but you come up with something very, uh, very different. And here's the, uh, what we finally got uh, with the, uh, the blue bars indicate 50% alcohol, the green is 70% and the red is 91% isopropyl. Uh, the, uh, this is a number of samples. So the, uh, this is a histogram. So all the blues add up to 20, all the greens add up to 17, all the reds add up to 12. This is our percent mite recovery on the first agitation. So if I go back, my wash one, wash two, wash three, wash four, I would total up all the mites we got from all the washes and then take the number reco we recovered from the first wash and divide it by the total. And then we could calculate out what our recovery was of the first wash. I, I want my mite washing to be done in 60 seconds. I don't want to be washing for several minutes. And we also found putting a timer on it was the best thing we ever did because 60 seconds of agitation seems like an eternity after you've done so. And, and 
Uh, unless you're timing yourself, I will tell you, you will underestimate 60 seconds tremendously if you think you're washing for 60 seconds. So, so we, uh, we calibrated this. What you can see is we often got fairly low recovery, a little more than half the mites with the 50% alcohol. With 70%, lowest recovery was on the first one was 80, 84%. Uh, uh, and got a lot of them up there in the high 90s, but we still got some you know, 80, 80 to 90 recoveries. With the 90% alcohol, we didn't have any recoveries lower than 96% on the first wash. So 90% alcohol uh, does a much better recovery than the cheap one. So we shifted uh, um, uh, away from the 50% and went to the high uh, proof alcohol. Now, some of you right now may be saying, Randy, um, we can't get alcohol right now <laughs> because of all the COVID and people wanting sanitizers. If you go down to the, the store now, you may not be able to buy alcohol. And I am well aware of that. And I will be showing you other alternative liquids that you can use in a minute. So no, no questions coming in, huh, Pat? No. Nope. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I was curious, why, why did the 90% work so much better than the 50? Well, I wondered if it affected the precipitation, how fast the mites sink through the alcohol. And when I look at the specific gravity, it wasn't that much different as far as density. Mites are more dense than the alcohol, so they sink in alcohol. Um, um, but it could also be a chem uh, the chemical bonding, you know, or viscosity or something. So I measured in my cups that the mites have to sink for two and a half inches to get from a B at the top of the sample to the bottom of the sample. So that tells me the depth that I'm interested in. So we set up, went out to the field and filled a graduated cylinder full of different kinds of alcohol, different concentrations. We then uh, look up here, here's a pair of insect forceps. We had gently pick up a mite. We, we used powdered sugar dusting right here, powdered sugar container here to shake the uh, live mites off of the bees, drop the mites one at a time onto the top of the alcohol, the powdered sugar would dissolve, and then the mites would accelerate by gravity until they reached their terminal velocity as they're falling through the alcohol. You could see a mite right here sinking down. And when they pass the start point, we click the stopwatch. And when they pass the two and a half inch point, we click the stopwatch. And we timed how many seconds or fraction of a second it took for the mites to fall that two and a half inches. Did I, did I make that clear, Pat, what I did? Okay, I'm looking at your face. I'm seeing if you're looking confused or not. So I'm timing how long it takes the mites to, fa to fall by gravity through different concentrations of alcohol to fall that two and a half inches. Okay, here's the results. So blue, 50% alcohol, purple, 70%, red, 91%. And here's our number of replicates right here. And here's how many, time, how many seconds to sink. And you can see, these are the median values right here. The median time to sink in the 91% alcohol was about two and three quarters seconds. Median time for 50% alcohol was almost five seconds. So the mites sink almost twice as fast in 90% alcohol as they do in 50% alcohol. I found that to be fascinating and surprising. Okay, so that may be one of the factors of why we get better mite recovery in the higher proof alcohol. Now, what about windshield wipe, wiper fluid? That's an excellent question. We'll get to that. And let me ask you, what, what, which windshield wiper, what, kind, what degrees do you use? For how many degrees is it rated? I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, one person asked about methyl alcohol, such as windshield wiper fluid. Okay, windshield wiper fluid is mostly water with some methyl alcohol in it. And that's why the amount of methyl alcohol is dependent upon what degree rating the windshield wiper fluid is. So anybody who can tell me what degree rating the fluid, you're going to have a zero degree, you're going to have a negative 15 degree, you're going to have a 20 degree rating, depending upon where you live. Uh, so if anybody can answer that question, let Pat know what rating uh, is. One person says um, 
That's, that's how many degrees, say how many degrees Fahrenheit on it? Minus 20. Minus 20, okay. So um, I'll, we'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a minute then. So here's my question now. What causes the mites to actually release from the bees? Is it the toxicity of the liquid? So alcohol, clearly toxic. Methyl alcohol, quite toxic. Uh, irritation from the liquid. So is, is the, uh, does the mite feel irritated and released because of that? Is it the wetting action or the surfactant action? Does that affect the, the impodia of the mite's feet? Does it break the surface tension uh, or the, the, the bonding of those moist uh, impodia to the bee's body? Or is it just the physical agitation that beats the mites away from the, um, uh, the mites from the bees? Most people, I think, are thinking it's physical agitation because when you watch somebody do an alcohol wash, they really do it really, really hard or the powdered sugar shake. Now, with the sugar roll, I was curious about this. And um, the, what I had heard is the sugar roll works because you first, and it's called sugar roll instead of sugar shake. You put the powdered sugar over the bees, you roll them around in it, then you wait, put them in a shady place, and you wait for a minute or two. And the, the hypothesis was that the bees' bodies would heat up enough that would cause the mites to release. And then uh, once they did that, the mites would then walk on these powdered bees and, and their sticky impodia would get clogged up with the powdered sugar and they would then dislodge from the mites and, and fall off. So I, I just wrote to uh, Megan Milbrath and uh, Katie Lee said, hey, you guys, you got a reference for that about somebody who studied the heating of the bees? And both of them said, um, well, we don't know if there is actually a study. Every, we just repeat it. <laughs> so I'm not sure there is any actual data out there on that. So I'm going to be running some trials and measuring the temperature of those bees and see uh, just what is happening. And, and how much agitation, how much wait time is done. I mean, a lot of people use a sugar shake and they're surprising a little hard data as to why and how it works and how to do it most, uh, most accurately. Okay, so let's look at the 91% alcohol. I was curious about that because that's what we were using. And- Okay, um, I I got, yeah. and the second one, second question, what about 91% alcohol with detergent? That's also a very good question. I'll, keep, I'll be answering that one too. I really like it when you guys are pre-asking the questions I've already got on the slideshow to answer. That means that you're actually thinking the same type of things that I'm, had the same questions that I have and that we're gonna come up with answers. So I'm, I'm happy to get those questions, okay? Um, so I, I took some alcohol and 91% um, alcohol, let's see. Yeah, this is 91, nine, whoops, what did I do here? Oop, I hit the wrong one. New share, back to here. I took some 91% alcohol and I, I took six little custard cups of it and filled each custard cup full of 91% alcohol and then made a little cylinder um, with a screen on the bottom and would shake a, a thin layer of bees into that uh, cylinder, so just one layer deep. Uh, that had mites on them, and then it would move that cylinder every 10 seconds to a new cup. So over 60 seconds, I would, I would, uh, it would go, it would go through six different cups. And then I went back, and and then I would, add, then I would put those mites, the remaining bees, in an agitator, recover the rest of the mites, figure out the total mites, and I could see what percentage of the total mites dropped off every 10 seconds, without any agitation whatsoever, just simple immersion in the alcohol, and you can see. By 20 seconds, I was getting 50% of the mites just dropping off. By 30 seconds, 75% of the mites, and then no more, and then maybe a little bit more by 60 seconds. So this was a very small trial, a small number of bees. There's enough, this would be a preliminary brief study, but enough to make me want to do a bigger one. So I took a much larger plastic container, cut the bottom out of it, and uh, glued a screen to the bottom of it, so I could dump a few hundred bees into this container, uh, immerse the container in alcohol and sprinkle a single layer of bees over there. I only wanted a single layer of bees because I, I didn't want the mites to get hung up in the bees' bodies. So if they came loose and dropped off, I wanted them to, to fall by themselves. So last fall, I, I did this and I gave them two minutes. So here's the, there's a big white tub completely full of 91% alcohol. 
here's the plastic container and you can see the screen glued to the bottom. And I shook a, once I got the container into the alcohol, I would uh, do a um, shake bees from a hive, scoop them up and just sprinkle the bees in the alcohol until I got roughly one thickness of bees up to 500 uh, bees over here. And within seconds, you just start seeing all these mice just coming out with no agitation whatsoever. So I did uh, um, four replicates of this. Um, and uh, so this is the, the mite drop without any agitation. And this is the total number of mites that were in the sample. And um, this is the percent recovery of mites without any agitation whatsoever in 91% alcohol. Pretty good recovery right here. Okay, you're, you're in, the, in the 90 percentile with no agitation at all. I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. You, could, you guys might be interested in that about saving your arm as far as the amount of agitation. Now, the problem is that was a single layer of bees. And you'll see from data coming up, if that layer of bees is thicker, you don't get that recovery uh, by, a, by a long shot with alcohol, although you may get it with another fluid. So now the question uh, in addressing your uh, good questions, how about using other liquids? So here's the liquids I have tested so far to date. And California, I went out to get the negative 15 degree and all I can find is zero, but I, I now have some 15 degrees, so I'm gonna test that. And let me describe each of these different liquids, what I'm looking at. This is 30% methyl alcohol. Methyl alcohol is quite toxic to uh, all animals, much more toxic than ethyl alcohol or isopropyl alcohol. And it has a very, very small amount of surfactant. Not many, if you shake it up, there's, you don't get much bubbles on top of this. That surprised me that there's so little surfactant in a windshield wiper fluid, but they, they don't put much surfactant into it. So this would be an example of a toxic alcohol at a fairly low concentration, only 30%, without any surfactant. The rubbing alcohol has a much better surfactant action. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, 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 it breaks the surface tension. It's also going to be somewhat of an, irrit uh, somewhat of an ir irritant. 91% has even a lower surface tension than the 50% and also is an alcohol which may kill the mites. Then I, I, got, uh, I looked under the kitchen counter and my uh, wife had bought some Dawn Ultra pure uh, lemon essence, but it was a clear dishwashing detergent. Now, I had experiment with dishwashing detergent previously, and I said, oh God, it gets so foamy, that's a pain in the butt. How about finding a non-foamy detergent? And uh, my mother has a, a dishwasher, uh, automatic dishwasher, and she was using Cascade low suds dishwashing detergent you know, with all the claims for grease cutting and stuff, I go, great, here's a really strong detergent, not designed for hand washing. This is for, you know, machine washing and low suds. And I tested that out. You get very poor mite recovery with that. <laughs> I can tell you that right now. So then I was looking at this surfactant action. Well, the way you can tell if something has a surfactant action, if it reduces surface tension, is it will cause foaming. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever played with soap bubbles much, but I used to teach science for elementary school classes and we did lots of experiments with soap bubbles. If you want to do a cool one, if you got natural gas, you just dissolve some Dawn detergent in water and put a, a hose to a natural gas uh, tap and let it bubble through the Dawn detergent and it formed big old bubbles. And when you get a lump of bubbles, they will be lighter than air because methane is lighter than air. And that water bubbles will float up through the air and you reach out with a match and touch it. It makes a very impressive demonstration. Uh, don't do that in a flammable classroom. Though We had a concrete classroom, so we could do all kinds of fun things. Um, anyway, <laughs> if you want to blow soap bubbles, you always use Dawn detergent. Any, any recommendation is because it has the best bubble action, okay? It's the best surfactant action. So this was non-irritating because it's a hand dishwashing liquid, non-toxic, but a very strong surfactant action, okay? And I thought, well, where can I find something that's really irritating to mites that has some surfactant, but a low, uh, low toxicity? Well, I thought, oh, how about some Listerine mouthwash, okay? 
So I got a brand new big container of Listerine mouthwash. Now this is 30% ethyl alcohol. So fairly low alcohol and not a very toxic alcohol. Um, and it also has a surfactant on it. And let's see, hang on a second. Oh, okay, hang on a second. Let me go. Dang, I was gonna show you a, whoa. Okay, here's a Listerine. My slides are out of order. So it has um, uh, eucalyptol, menthol, and thymol. These are the active ingredients of uh, ap ap what are those little uh, little pads that you put in the hives from from Europe? Uh, ap they all start with ap. Anyway, the ones that are the essential oils in the pads, they have eucalyptol, menthol, and thymol in them. These things all kill mites. And then methyl salicylate, which is wintergreen oil, also kills mites. So these are all mite killing essential oils, very irritating to the mites. So great. Here I found an irritant with a 27% uh, a, uh, alcohol and a very strong surfactant. And to test that, you can shake it up and you can see a good surfactant action in here, okay? So this, here's my test liquid for an irritant with a surfactant action. Let's go, oh, wait a second. Okay, whoop, where am I? Okay, so here we go. Our different li liquids to test right here. So first let's look at the toxicity of liquid. So what I would do is I would put some bees with mites into the liquid and agitate them for 60 seconds for the mites to drop off. And then I immediately poured the liquid through a sieve to get the mites out of the liquid and wash them with fresh water. Get that liquid from them. And then I would tap the mites out onto a piece of filter paper and allow it to dry. And I would observe these mice to see what percent of the mice, how long it took the mice to recover and how many of them walked off the piece of filter paper afterwards. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, you curious about the findings here? Oh, where am I? Oh no. Hang on. I just reorganized that slide and I didn't get the slide back in the right place. Criminy. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Current slide. <laughs> okay. Windshield wiper fluid. First, the mites did not, most of, all these other fluids, the mites were Im, Im, immobile when I took them out of it. Other than this one, these mites were still crawling around just fresh and lively. And they all walk, almost all of them walked off the filter paper. So very low toxicity, even despite the methyl alcohol of the windshield wiper fluid. Okay, 50% alcohol. And I already knew that they would live with 50% alcohol because we used this for a long time. We found out the mites would, would dry out and walk away. Um, but they'd all be immobile at first. They all look dead. But even without washing them off, I can tell you, they, they are not dead. And almost all of them would walk away off the filter paper. 91% alcohol, dead. Very few of them survived. The Dawn detergent, very slow recovery. They were immobile for a long time. I thought they were dead. And then about a third of them walked off. The Listerine, very quick recovery, about two thirds of them. So despite having those four toxic essential oils in there, most of those mites walked off the Listerine. I'll let you all digest that for a minute. <laughs> so what is it that is causing the mice to drop off? Okay, and it's not, not necessarily them getting killed right away, and it's not necessarily the irritation. I wanna change that, okay. So then what I did is set up my, uh, a, better, a better one, I downloaded a, a timer from my cell phone and set up uh, cups right here. And I each, uh, I use my whitewash cup. So I have a cup that fits inside of the screen at the bottom. And the bees were stacked 
higher in these cups. So this is different from that one where I did where they were in a single layer. And I can, after I went, so I tested each of those liquids going to the 60 seconds. And after the 60 seconds, I would then uh, let the liquid drain off, put them in 91% alcohol, and then did the two, two one, 300 RPM agitations, uh, 300 revolution agitations, uh, in 91% alcohol, and recovered all the remaining mites. And then I could ca calculate out what percent of the mites dropped at each stage. And here's a bunch of data right here for us to look at. Okay, so this is a uh, Dawn uh, detergent right here. And when you, so this is a high wetting, a high uh, strong surfactant. And we got a median 93% of the mites would drop off within the first minute. Okay, uh, ranging from about 70 to 100%. Um, this, this really surprised me how much mites would drop off in the Dawn because it didn't kill all the mites. Okay, it's only, it's only, it, it's killing some, but not all of them. Today, um, we, was my first day of doing a lot of alcohol washes with the Dawn detergent. We shifted everything over to Dawn detergent today because we uh, want to save our remaining alcohol in case we need it for COVID <laughs> uh, sterilization. And interestingly, as I went out to the field and would shake the mites into the cup of detergent, and I'd walk back over to the car and hand over to my assistant who was doing the washing, I would look at the bottom of the cup and I would watch the mice just dropping like crazy as I walk over to the car. And the 60 seconds or so that it took me to walk to the car, I said, well, we gotta count this. So we counted a bunch of the, of the mites when I made it to the car, how many had dropped, and then we compared it to how many uh, more when we did the agitation. And we're up there in the high percentages before we do any agitation whatsoever with the Dawn, okay? And let me, let me jump ahead and explain what I'm seeing. When you drop mites into alcohol, 91% alcohol, they sink to the bottom of the screen immediately. And the bees stop moving. They die very quickly. So any mites that come off, we already know that with one layer, the mites will drop off very quickly. But if the, the bees are piled up and the mites die quickly and the bees die quickly, those mites are not going to move until there's agitation. Okay, and we'll see data on that later on. If you put the bees into Dawn detergent, they don't sink immediately. It takes them a while to wet and then they sink slowly down. They also don't die immediately. The, they, the bees move around and struggle for quite a while. So even without any agitation on your part, the bees are moving around enough that if the mites release, the bees agitate enough that the mites drop out of their own gravity allows them to precipitate out of their own accord. So this is what I'm, and I'll tell you right now, I'm telling you observations I've made in the last couple of hours right now, okay, of, of what I'm seeing. Okay, okay people so are asking about um, the concentration of the Dawn. Oh, two tablespoons per gallon. Uh, the, the range of one to two tablespoons per gallon gives, I tested a whole range of them. One to two tablespoons per gallon gave me very good recovery. So two tablespoons per gallon, I mix it up in half gallon mason jars, so we, that's one tablespoon per half gallon. Um, uh, when you drop below, down to a half tablespoon per gallon, the recovery rate uh, drops off and there's no benefit uh, gained after the one tablespoon per gallon. So we're doing two tablespoons per gallon just to uh, be conservative. It doesn't seem to make it any uh, less easy to use. And I And before you guys ask me, I have not tested other brands of detergent. Feel free to test as many brands of detergent you, as you want and let me know. But the, the Dawn Ultra and the Clear, um, so all my data is from that. Okay, Listerine. So this is um, fairly good wetting with the surfactant. And um, we got 84% uh, median might drop in the first 60 seconds. Um, for 91% alcohol, look at that. Remember we got the 93% with the single layer of bees, only 51% because with the thicker layer of bees, they don't drop, they don't get, they can't drop out. So um, what works with a single layer does not work with a thick layer of bees. And the windshield wiper fluid, 
pretty low, <laughs> pretty low. Um, and that's with the, for zero degree windshield wiper fluid, I have not tried the negative 15. I'll run a couple of them and see what happens, but I was not impressed by the uh, windshield wiper uh, fluid. We have a Listerine yeah. related question. Um, how yeah. toxic the essential oils are or what concentrations are needed? Obviously higher than that. I had a hard time believing this 91% alcohol after I've seen the 90 plus percent recovery. So I ran a bunch, a bunch more for three minutes of immersion and still got the same number, right around 50%. So um, uh, if, if the bees are piled up, you cannot expect you will, if you dump the bees in a cup of fluid and don't do any agitation, the bees are piled up a number of bees thick, you get much better drop from the Dawn detergent than you do from the 91%. Now, when I add agitation, I'm gonna show you the data for that in a minute, okay? And that changes things. Any other questions on this data here? No. Okay. So I'm still wondering, is it wetting action or irritation? And uh, I just moved a bunch of these around, so maybe that's out of order. Okay, let's see. Okay, yeah, so here's the Listerine. I gotta put those in order. And now, you might ask, well, what if you <laughs> use the liquids and you also agitate now? So let me show you the data for that. So I did a 60 second agitation, 300 revolutions in 60 seconds with the bees swirling around and it tumbles all the, I've designed these agitators so that all the bees at the bottom layer do tumble so any mites can precipitate down down via uh, gravity. This, this is very easy for me. I, I live in the gold country of California where uh, uh, we were founded on gold panning where you have gravel with chunks of gold in it and you need to agitate the gravel and have the gold precipitate by gravity down to the less dense gravel. It's exactly the same thing trying to precipitate the mites from the bees. So first, and the best agitation action is the swirl, no up or down. If you do up or down, you just keep stirring the mites back up through the bees. You wanna do a round and round or a back and forth swirl, but not any up or down. Yeah. Okay, um, you are using your shaker cups. I assume, what if we use an easy Varroa shaker brand like it's sold at suppliers? Let me know. I don't know. I've got one, but I have not tested that, okay? It'll probably be similar. I find that the, the okay, so that that uh, Varroa Easy Check the, from Vito, they copied my mite washer and they asked me about it and they sent me prototypes when they were developing it. They never said thank you, but uh, that, that was, they, they copied my invention. Um, and I, I find it awkward to hold on to for doing the swirl, but maybe the swirl's not even necessary is what I'm seeing now. And uh, so I am now in the process of developing, uh, re revisiting my cups. I just ordered a bunch of uh, different styles of cups to test out and we'll see if we can improve upon uh, both my design I'm using now and uh, improve upon the, the Vito uh, one. I found the Vito one just a little bit awkward to use, but my guess is if you're using, no, I didn't want to tell you guesses. Uh, I got data. If I got data, I'll tell you the answer. <laughs> Other people, there's plenty of beekeepers out there who have plenty of opinions not based on data and plenty of good guesses, okay? So you don't need to get any other guesses from me. Okay, so here's some data. This is um, uh, one minute of, of agitation, 300 RPM, looking at our recovery rate with five replicates for each uh, different one. So first one, 90%, 91% uh, alcohol. Okay, and this was, um, this is uh, data I got uh, in September, um, but I was getting this very high uh, recovery right here. So we're, we're up there in the 90s. Dawn Ultra, this was done in May, again, we're getting very high recoveries. We got all, all up in the 90s, over 183, so a, a median of 98. Now this is only ends of five, but you know, they're, what you can see with this much variation, um, you know, doing it 
a greater number of replicates, you're not going to learn much. There's inherent veg uh, variation. You're going to see that. So these median values are probably fairly good. So here's our range, and there's our median value. Okay, this one is <laughs> Listerine, median of 79%, ranging from 65 to 95. And with the AutoZone zero degree windshield wiper fluid, uh, range of 76 to 81%. So this the windshield wiper fluid with agitation will work, but you can save a lot of money uh, by going with the um, uh, just going with the Dawn detergent and get much better uh, recovery or with the 90% alcohol. So I personally I would not waste my money on the windshield wiper fluid. Okay, now there are some issues with the alcohol wash. Um, and especially if you use the high proof alcohol. So let's just say you're you're doing alcohol wash when the nectar flow is on. Well, you can have a bunch of bees that look like this on the bottom side. They're they're secreting wax from their wax glands. You have all these wax flakes. And when you do alcohol wash, you may have a whole bunch of wax flakes in there. Now this would be with 50% alcohol. You, you would see this the bro. It makes it hard to count the mites. With 91% alcohol, I find it dissolves some of this wax and it gums up your cups and you have to wipe, wipe them out with a paper towel. So that was one of the <coughs> drawbacks on 91%. So these are the wax flakes on the bottom of the bee during a nectar flow. And if you alcohol wash those bees, you get this at the bottom of the cup. You get a bunch of those wax flakes there and it's hard to see the, um, the mites in them. Okay. With detergent, are you seeing a picture of the, the uh, detergent in the foam now? Yes. Okay, we're back on good. Okay, so, and here's something on my agitator. This, I was watching these today, and what I learned is that we, when you first are agitating, you get vigorous action of the bees swirling around. But as the foam builds up, when it finally, the foam completely fills the top, then it suppresses the agitation of the bees uh, still, it's got adequate, but they don't move around as much. So uh, it, the, the detergent works just fine uh, with the agitator, uh, happy with it. The problem is when you're looking down, you can't see the mites because of the foam. So there's my son's right here, uh, back using the old agitator, but a picture of, of uh, uh, them holding it up and counting from the bottom. Well, here's the problem of counting mites from the bottom. If you only want to count three or four mites, it's not a big deal. But for data, we have to collect, count a whole lot more. You can't hold your hand steady enough and the mice jiggle around above you and you cannot count ac accurately. It's also kind of a pain in the butt looking up. Uh, so I prefer to count looking down. But you can't do that. So here's the trick I learned. You get a, a 10x magnifying mirror. This is the kind of mirror that women use for plucking their eyebrows or nose hairs, whatever the heck women pluck off their face. Um, but the 10x magnifying mirror, there's different magnifications. So when you order one, order the 10x one. And I'm, I, the six inch is working well. I got a four inch coming to test it out. And I'll publish my findings when I find out works best. And what this does, you put it underneath the cup and you look down and man, it enlarges the mites. The mites are so big, you can see their legs easily. And you can count them so much easier after, I mean, my, my assistant and I today, uh, you know, we've counted thousands of, of, of washes looking down and the mirror just revolutionized everything. The only thing you have to do is when you put it back in the car, you got to make sure it's not, curve is not facing up because if the sun comes in the window, it can start a fire if you just happen to have something at the focus, which actually happened today in one of the trucks. So <laughs> the fire didn't start, but there was smoke. And so make sure that the mirror has a holder or something when you put it away. And what I use now is I built stands right here. So here's on our mite wash table. Here's Brooke, my assistant. I took I just took this picture a couple of hours ago. She looking down. Um, oh no, this was yesterday with the we were still using alcohol. So the the stand holds the cup and you look down here so you can look in the mirror and you can count very easily your, your mite. So this is, uh, if you're gonna use the Dawn, I would definitely invest in a 10X magnifying mirror for doing the counting. Okay, 
How are we doing for time? 511. So I got a few things I could, first I got to answer questions if you have questions right now. Um, no new questions. We do have a question, um, I guess towards the end, it's, it's a little off topic. That's fine. You want to um, ask it now? They say, before you are done, could you talk a bit about your findings regarding the likelihood and magnitude of bee migration from diseased and dying colonies to other colonies? Um, I, let me give you the brief. I mean, I got a whole PowerPoint on that. So let me give you the, the brief version is yes, there is drift of, of bees. And in the experiment that I ran, which I have not yet uh, written up and published, um, we had two control hives that were completely free of mites sitting next to the, uh, the seven hives that we intentionally collapsed from mites. And we wanted to, I wanted to, my hypothesis was that as the colony, the amount of D4 wing virus built up inside those hives and they started collapsing, that since D4 wing virus affects, is clearly replicates in the bees' brains, it would do what other viruses do and perhaps cause the host to have a behavior which would help to transmit it, which many viruses do. They change the host behavior of, of the ants or the fish or the um, what, whatever they are, are, are in um, to get them, or, or the mice or the rats to make them more susceptible to transmit. So that was my hypothesis. And what I found was of the two control hives, one of them had the lowest amount of bee drift of any hive in the test and the other one had the highest amount of bee drift of any bee in the test. All the collapsing hives fell between the two control hives. So my hypothesis that I was testing that the collapse of a colony from deforming virus would increase the amount of drifting, my data did not support that hypothesis. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that bees don't drift we found that there was considerable drift between colonies. And what you might assume is that most of that drift would be to a nearby hive. And my data did not support that hypothesis either, that there was a proportionally more drift, more than what you would expect by just you know, a random chance of landing up in X number of square feet in the landscape. Um, so let's, let's just say that, that you had a tall tower and you dropped pieces of paper straight down from that tall tower and there was no wind. Most of the paper would fall directly below, below the tall tower. But some of it would flutter and fall further and further away. The further away you got from that tower, the less paper you would see. You might expect drifting of bees to follow that same pattern, that, that you would have the highest proportion of bees drifting to nearby hives as opposed to far away hives. My findings <laughs> were that's not the case at all with drifting bees. We got much higher rates of drift from colonies that were 500 feet to half a mile away than we did to the ones that were very close. So I think we need to do more research an understanding on the drifting of bees and what actually causes bees to drift to other hives. And yes, there is substantial drift of bees from mite infested hives and healthy hives to other hives, uh, a lot up to a half mile away, some to a mile away. We didn't get any at the further than a, a mile away, but I can assure you that a half mile away, we got substantial drift of of bees and mites to those hives. Does that answer the question? No response. I, I have one question here um, about the, um, the wash. If multiple layers of bees are a problem, what about using wide shallow vessels for testing? That's a great idea. Yeah, that would, that would work just fine. You, you only have to give it just with, if you use Dawn or, or, or alcohol, well, alcohol, you only have to, get, well, if you use alcohol, you don't have to give it a slight jiggle. But as I said, with the Dawn, because the bees move around so much, 
in there, you get a very high recovery, even with the deeper layer bees. But yes, putting them in a, 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 a wider vessel so um, would work great. It's just a little more awkward to do that. Okay, so here's what I can talk about right now. I can uh, talk about which frame to take a bee sample from. I could talk about my selective breeding program uh, for mites. I got both of those loaded up on the same slideshow. Um, your choice. Tell you what, let me, um, oh, th th let's look at this here. How many bees to sample? So people would say, well, I don't want to sacrifice a full half cup of bees. So what if I just do, you know, a, 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 a smaller amount? What if I do a quarter cup or an eighth cup of bees? So what you can do is you can go on, on your computer very easily and look up a bino binomial calculator. And let's just say you want to detect a 1% infest infestation in your hive. And you only, so that'd be a 1% infestation. And let's just say, well, I just want to take 100 bees. So 100 bees is about an eighth of a cup of, of bees. And you want to see if, uh, uh, and that, uh, so out of 100 bees, a 1% infestation would be one mite per 100 bees. So you, you see what you would get from one mite. And I'm going to look for what's the probability of a false negative. So a saying, oh, there is no infestation. You got a 36% chance of getting a false negative. Now you're hearing about a, a, this a lot with, with COVID testing right now, false negatives and false positives. Well, with Barreau, you're concerned about false negatives. So if you want to be able to detect a 1% mite infestation, 100 bees would not be adequate to, uh, to do it. Now, if you, a, a half cup of bees is about 315 bees. Okay, one minute, Pat. So I, I ran it for, if you had 315 bees and you have a 1% infestation, you'd expect to get three mites per 100 bees. And your chance of getting um, uh, uh, th uh, at least three mites would be 61%. If you said just one or just two mites, you're gonna get uh, two mites um, 80 or, uh, or more 82% of the time. And if you said, well, I'll just go for one mite, 95% of the time you'd, you'd get this. So the point is you get a lot fewer false negatives, very, very low percentage. So um, you're never in any one wash going to get it perfect, but it, to avoid false negatives, that half cup looks, looks pretty good. Okay, your question? Yeah, a lot of questions about which frame to take the bees from. Okay. What type of frame? Let's do that. How about that? Which frame do you take the bee sample from? Is that the answer? To that? <laughs> okay, so we know that the mice prefer the nurse bees. And for a couple of reasons. One, the nurse bees have a uh, much better developed fat bodies. So the, it's, they're more nutritious for the nurses to feed on. And the second, once a, a female mites, uh, the sperm have developed in her and she's uh, ready to fertilize eggs. So the sperm comes from the male, from the mating, but the sperms are not fully developed until uh, a, a couple, few days after mating. So once those sperms develop and she can fertilize an egg, she wants to get into a brood cell, a cell with a, um, a larva about to um, uh, be sealed over. The only bees that will ever give her a ride to that cell are the nurse bees. So the, the mites hop off the newly emerged bee as quick as they can, and they hop a ride onto a nurse bee. Now, when we look at colony population dynamics, these nurse bees will be these are bees, zero to 12 days old, 13 to 24. The nurses will be these bees that in, the, in the, this red to orange area. Uh, uh, that'd be your younger bees. And you can see in, during the middle of summer, maybe two thirds of your bees in the hive are young bees and not very many bees are older bees because the older bees start to die off pretty quick when they, once they start foraging. So typically a hive has mostly young bees. Here's an old paper from 1985, the Germans. There's, um, and I found very little research on this, looking at the frames. And what they found, they went on a single uh, a brood chamber hives. They didn't say whether these frames contained brood or not, but they found this is your mite infestation rate on the, on the uh, y-axis. And they found 
you typically find a higher mite infestation rate on the center combs right there. So typically people say, well, let's select from the brood nest. But some more recent work, uh, Vanderstein, 2010, he um, had 10 frame hives and he broke all the bees down with March, marked bees by age class, with the youngest bees here to the oldest bees, with the nurse bees would be in these two age classes. And you can see that proportion of young bees is pretty much the same for any frame in the hive. So this, looking at this data, you think, well, it wouldn't make any difference which frame you, you, went, you selected from. <clears throat> so last fall, I put it to the test and went out to, um, um, uh, uh, when we were, had some of our failed uh, breeder queens, which had a very high mite. So if you're gonna do any kind of research looking at mite recovery, you wanna start with high mite samples because the difference between one mite and two in a sample, you can't learn from. The difference between 40 mites and three mites, you can learn a lot from. So you need samples that have a lot of, of mites in them. So we went out and we picked up the, uh, a colony from the, homestand and we moved the frames oh, the two boxes away after smoking them gently so these bees didn't move and then put an empty box back on the homestand so any bees that uh, got into the air would fly back to the homestand and would not contaminate the combs that we took from the hive so so we're getting the actual bees from each one and set up data sheets and then I shook these bees every comb in the hive one frame at a time into a tub took a sample of mites, and sometimes it took two frames if, the, if I didn't have enough bees, because these were all high mite colonies not doing very well. Um, uh, 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 we, we alcohol washed it, and then we collected the uh, mite count off it, and I recorded what materials were on the comb, whether it was, uh, I'll show you here, whether it was just drawn comb, honey, bee bread, young larvae, mixed brood, or whether we happened to find the queen. And then below that, I put the mite count. So here, I combined two frames. There was not enough bees on any one of them. No bees over there. So look at, just look at this. This is one of the seven hives right here. And you see our uh, high mite counts on these, with mixed brood, you got up to 25 mites. But here's a frame with no brood whatsoever. And we got 25 mites. And the frame right next to it, we only got eight mites, okay, from the same size sample. So there's clearly a variation with the higher mite counts next to the brood nest and the lower mite counts further away from the brood nest. And <clears throat> this would be uh, not what I expected from this, that previous data where it showed even age distribution of the nurse bees. And, and I can today we're out sampling uh, doubles that had recently had uh, uh, the second box was, a, was a 10 frames of foundation and their bees are drawing it out. So there's no brood at all in the upper box. And when I shake the bees off these combs, I can tell how old the bees are by what proportion fly out of the tub. So in some colonies, like ones which had recently requeened themselves, dang near every bee flies out of the tub. You have all old bees from that sample. <clears throat> but when I shook the bees off those upper combs of partially drawn comb in that foundation from above the brood nest. So no brood on them whatsoever. Every damn bee stayed in the tub. So that means that you have a high proportion of very young bees right above the brood nest on those combs being drawn, but that not on brood combs themselves. Not necessarily on brood combs. So here's all the, the data from the seven, there's seven bars and then the average of the seven in black for each type of, of comb. And then this is the average when I, if I pull all the mite counts across the whole hive, so your average mite count per hive, I normalized all the values to one. So we can compare them, so we can compare all seven hives, all normalized by one, which means just divide by the um, total mite count. Uh, and uh, so everything is relative to, to the average. So for drawn combs, we typically were below the average mite count uh, for the whole colony. For the combs with young larvae, we were way higher than the average. We were two and a half times higher sometimes than the average for the colony. And with mixed brood of all ages, again, higher, maybe about you know 1.3 or 1.4 times, or this year, 1.5 times on average higher than 
the uh, colony average. Now, the frame of the queen could be above or below. But here's what's interesting. The honeycombs in the brood nest are the combs of the bee bread uh, without brood in the um, uh, uh, brood nest. They were very close to the colony average and not quite as variable as these other ones over here with the brood combs. The advantage is if you're sampling these combs, you have much less chance of accidentally getting the queen. Uh, and when I say getting the queen, not necessarily just in the sample, but you may just pulling those combs out are dangerous for the queen. You can roll the queen and kill the, kill the queen. So uh, in answer to your question, it depends on what question there is. I'll get to your question in a second, Pat. If your question is, where will you find the highest mite count in the hive? Then go to a frame with, with brood or young larvae. That will be the highest mite count. If you want to try to find the lowest mite count, go maybe to drawing combs way on the outside of the cluster. So the question is, what's the most representative mite count? What mite count are you, are you interested in? Here's the hard data. You make your own decision. Okay. For us, having to do this in our breeding program and for collecting data for testing mite treatments, I'm looking at what is closest to the most representative average for the entire hive. And what that tells me, I can avoid queens and get most representative by sampling combs adjacent to the brood nest, but not actual brood combs themselves. Okay, so that's what I'm doing, but it all depends upon what you want. What is your question? Okay, uh, well, we're, we are going to go over time, but um, there are a couple questions in case someone has to leave. Um, one is someone asking about the breeding program, and the second person is asking about cellulose, sponge, and oxalic acid. Okay. Um, so let's tell you what, we're going to skip this about letting the bees fly off. The answer is, yeah, let the bees fly off. Uh, you'll get a, um, you know, you'll get a, um, the bees that fly off have a lower mite level. They only have about 75% as high a mite infestation rate as the bees that remain in the tub afterwards. So that's a way of, if you, oops. <clears throat> if we go back to here, notice that these counts are a little bit lower than average. Well, if you let the bees fly out of the tub, then what you get is this brings these up to closer to average, okay? Um, okay, uh, let's talk about oxalic acid and sponges. Um, if you do use, and I am not in any way promoting that you guys do any off-label treatment, but if you do want to bleach your top bars with oxalic acid, <laughs> um, you do not want to use a pre-moistened sponge. So the cellular sponges, some are sold pre-moistened, and some are sold not pre-moistened. If they are pre-moistened, that surfactant may be toxic to the bees. So I would wash them out with water and let them dry. What we are testing right now is uh, the dry sponges, allowing them to soak up as much uh, oxalic acid glycerin as they will hold and then let it drip off. And we are using a one-to-one -one by weight uh, ratio of oxalic acid to glycerin. And one of the, uh, the, I think there's six by seven inch sponges, which is a, a standard size, that will hold 50 grams of oxalic acid, 100 grams of the whole mixture. And so we're testing, we're going to be testing out 25 grams, 50 grams, and 75 grams of oxalic acid uh, per hive and see uh, what works. Does that answer the question about the cellulose sponges? Uh, I guess so, no response. Okay. Okay, and the other one was on the breeding program? Yes. Okay, so what first thing we're finding is there does not seem to be any trade-off for selective breeding for mite resistance. In the yards, the, those colonies that are, yeah, let's just go down. There we go. Oh, let's go back up to. Okay, so like here's a breeder here. 
Here's the mite wash count in July, zero. In August, zero. In September, zero. In November, zero. And I took this back last fall. We have, we only got one colony that's got a zero the next March, but a lot of them, we had a lot of them that were ones or twos next March. And uh, as Brooke might say, well, zeros are heroes. We had a lot of colonies that were looking like this. They just, and they're in the middle of the yard. They may have colonies with high mites all around them. There's plenty of drift going on. And my, if the mites go in there, they just disappear. Now, I'm not saying there's no mites in these colonies, but they are undetectable by alcohol wash count. These are, and, and some of these colonies are some of the best colonies in the yard. There's a benefit to not having any mites in the hive from colony health and productivity. If you don't have any mites, you don't have deformed wing breasts and the colonies thrive. So we are not seeing these colonies any more defensive, and we're not seeing any suppression of, of colony strength or honey production. And so that's a really good thing. There's, we're not, you don't have to breed for nasty bees or non-productive bees. Um, the only ones we breed off are ones that we would want ourselves in our operation. And yes, we, so what our success, what we're doing now, is we've gone from fewer than 2% of our colonies that showed any signs of mite resistance. Uh, last season, it was 10% of our colonies. And we'll see what happens uh, this year on that. One of the things I realized, let me see if I can get to the next two. Oh yeah, so here, this is our percentage of colonies. So by the time we got to breeding in, uh, in, in April, we were down to about 7%, which is, we were pretty picky on those. The question is, if the resistance alleles, the genes we're looking at, are dominant, it's much more difficult to breed for them than if they're recessive. And the reason is, if you look at this colony, all these worker bees, they're all sisters, but they're only most of them are only half sisters. They each come from a different father. So if the queen made it with 20 drones, there's 20 different families of sisters here, each having a different father. Well, if the allele for resistance was carried by only one drone, and you only need 1 20th of the bees in the hive to take that first step, maybe that might be uncapping or olfactory detection or whatever it is, mechanism they use. Well, that means it may, all that resistance may come from one of the fathers. If you breed off the queen, she may not carry those genes at all. So just because the colony is resistant doesn't mean that the queen carries the genes for resistance. And that was a real eye-opener for me. So I did a whole bunch of these Punnett squares to find out what would, would happen. And with the resistant colony where you can say, oh, that queen has no resistance. So the only way to get around that is to do what's called progeny testing. And I didn't realize this until too late talking with some other uh, friend who was really good with genetics. And we noticed last year in, the, in our yards, we typically stock a yard for the daughters of one queen. And we were getting you know, low percentage of those daughters. Even though the, the, they're daughters of a queen of resistant colonies, we were still getting a low percentage of daughter colonies that were resistant. But there were two yards that half the colonies were resistant. And what that says, that indicates it may have been a, a dominant gene and only, and, and if the queen carried that resistance gene, then half of her daughter colonies were resistant. And that, see, that may be the most important thing to look at on our breeding program. You gotta track the performance of the daughter colonies to see if they, if half, if so, if the dominant trait and the, uh, the queen uh, uh, carries that, then half of her daughter colonies will be resistant. Okay, yeah, does that help with the, um, the breeding program? Um, probably, um, I, I have a question about sticky boards. Okay. Any benefit to using to find sticky boards to find average mite infestation? And it was yes to the, your previous question. It answered. There's a lot of problems with sticky boards. Okay, a lot of problems with sticky boards. The first thing, a sticky board count means nothing unless you also know the cluster size of the colony. If the colony has four frames compared to 20 frames of bees, the four frame is gonna have a much lower sticky board count. But that doesn't mean it has a lower bite infestation rate. It may have 10 times, or 
well, let's just say you're going from five frames to 20 frames, comparing the two, a, a, a colony, a 20 frame colony uh, would ha could have one quarter as, uh, the, as much mite infestation rate and have the same count as a four frame colony from a sticky board count. So you, first you have to take into account the strength of the colony. The second thing, sticky boards, half the bees that fall on the sticky board are newly emerged, half the mites are newly emerged mites that we're not gonna survive anyway. So, so much of what you see on the sticky board is freshly emerged mites that are, um, so it's representing what kind of, of, of emergence rate of bees are getting that day. And what I found when we do daily sticky board counts, they can vary by a factor of three day to day. So if you do a single sticky board count, you're not gonna learn much. You really have to do it over, over time. Um, because of this, because a sticky board count requires two trips minimum to the yard to see, and you have to account for the um, colony size, and you have to generally count a whole lot more mites too. Um, we don't use sticky board counts for mite monitoring. Now I'll, I'll use sticky board counts to show treatment efficacy and, and, and mite drop or mite immigration. So very good for mite immigration if you can zero the mites in your colony. So that's how I get data on mite immigration. So sticky boards have the use, but I'm not, I'm not enthusiastic about them for mite monitoring. Um, okay, so I figure we go maybe five more minutes. Uh, most of the people are hanging in there, uh, but I do have two questions. One's asking about um, thermal treatment um, for mites. And the second question is about how do you get enough bees for a sample? Enough bees. What we do for getting a bit of bees, we just shake a frame <coughs> into uh, a tub, let the older bees fly out. And if it looks like there's much more than a half cup of bees in that tub, we just scoop them out and put them back in the hive. And then we shake out the, the, the sample of bees uh, level on the tub. The young bees within a few seconds will all spread out evenly and often start working, walking in the same direction. So it's very easy then to pick out the queen and avoid sampling a, a, a queen. Um, but typically any frame that has, it's even partially covered with the bees will have enough, enough bees for a, 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 three, a half cup sample of bees. And then I, I pick them up, I pick up the, the cup, I just take my finger, I just level it off, wipe the bees off. Never, ever, ever, I do thousands and thousands of these, I never, ever get stung in the finger. The bees, the younger bees, you can handle them all you want on the cup, you level it off, they're not gonna sting you. The thermal heat um, oh, yeah. for Varroa. Okay, so the, the trick is, Varroa is very, is, Varroa is not well adapted to the, it still likes a cooler temperature. It's well adapted for drone brood of Apis serrana, which runs at a, a cooler temperature than the worker brood of Apis mellifera. Um, and mites get stressed pretty easily when you start getting up above 100 uh, degrees. So honeybees can take up to 115 degrees pretty well, and the brood candle also. The mites cannot. The question then is, you don't want to overheat the colony, and you don't want to soften the combs too much. So the temperature has to be very narrow range to be effective. And I've talked to some of the uh, people who are selling these thermal treatment hives and the data looks good what they're showing me and, I, and I, I've offered a number of times, send me one for testing, I'll return it, I'll give you hard data on it. And uh, so far, uh, no one sent me anything. Anybody wanna send me one? Uh, I'll return it to you and uh, I'll collect hard data and uh, um, yeah, hard objection. I'll give you hard objective data of what kind of results we get. Okay, any final questions? I think we have to wrap it up here. Uh, I know a lot of people are getting tired. Oh, murder hornets. Yeah, so you guys got nothing to worry about right now. There have been, what it is, is, is the Portland area, the, the port up there is the first stop for uh, cargo ships coming over from uh, Asia. And occasionally uh, a Hornet Queen uh, will hitchhike on one of those ships. And there have been more than one in the last few years uh, got loose and they found them. Um, what's of interest is my son, sold a nuke today. We get, we sell uh, nucleus colonies. People drive down from Oregon and Washington um, 
to pick up nukes from us and take them back up there. One of the guys drove down from Washington. He goes, oh, God, last year, these huge wasps. God, they were tearing apart my colony. I took the lid off. These wasps stung me. I've never been stung like that before. It's a huge wasp. I just burned that colony. And I said, well, and my son told me, so I called this beekeeper. I said, were, were, were they yellow jackets? And he goes, oh, no, way huger than yellow jackets. I said, were they bald-faced hornets? Oh, no, way bigger than that. And a sting like I've never felt before. And I said, did you report this? Oh, no, it was too hard to report. <laughs> so I said, would you mind? I called him back and said, would you mind if I file the report with, with Washington State and, and, and Canada? And he goes, oh, go ahead. So I did. And so I've had uh, time to talk with the, the, the people in charge up there. And found out, yes, <coughs> there has been more than one introduction. They're on top of it now. They're working on baits to trap them. I've also talked with beekeepers from, from uh, Japan who are not really that concerned about them. They're, they're, they're actually uh, sold for food over there, the larvae, the larvae are. <coughs> and, um, and they're not that big of a problem in, in hives normally. But they also apparently are fairly easy to control. So we should get uh, we have every reason to expect that we'll be able to do complete eradication of these invasions, and um, unlikely that they're going to spread uh, to the rest of the United States. And it's unfortunate, they said, murder, murder hornets, they're called sparrow insects over in Japan. They're not, they're not feared. They're not, that word murder, and that's just, that's just ridiculous. They're, they're a, a large beneficial wasp that happens to prey on bee colonies sometimes. Um, and uh, we don't want them here at all in the United States. I would be much more concerned about the Asian wasp that has uh, 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 Vespa vetulina that has invaded Europe. Uh, it was over in France and they are a pain in the butt. They just, they're all over these hives. They hover in front of the hive and they pick off the returning foragers. And the, when I visited, the beekeepers had tubs of, of sugar syrup out around all their hives and the wasps go in and drown, and the tubs are all full of just thousands of these drowned wasps that just make it really difficult because they pick off all the bees for the winter cluster before winter, and it weakens your colony. So that's a wasp we don't want. Uh, I'm more, much more concerned about those than I am about the uh, mandarina, which is the, um, the one they're calling the murder, murder hornet. hornet. All right, well, that's it. Randy, thank you so much for doing this um, webinar and uh, let's do it again sometime this, later this year, I hope. Okay, take care, Pat, and good night, everybody. Hey, thank you. I'm gonna go out and graph queens right now. <laughs> Have fun, goodbye. Okay, thanks. <laughs>